you want to understand how shoulder internal rotation gets limited by anterior compression, watch the rest of the video. Good morning. Happy Friday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. I got a million and one things to do today. So we're going to dive right into today's q and It comes from Johnny. And Johnny has a question about shoulder internal rotation. And he, he asks, can you describe the mechanism at play when trying to decrease anterior compression either the pelvis or the thorax? For instance, some activities I've seen to increase shoulder internal rotation are aimed at increasing pump handle mechanics of the sternum by positioning the humerus. In using this position, is there an intramuscular pressure gradient that compresses the distal attachment muscle like pec major while allowing the proximal fibers to expand? Also, to reduce anterior compression, do you typically use asymmetrical activities? Johnny, this is a really good question, and, and you, you've really touched on a really cool topic, and, and you are um, very correct in, in your uh, perspective here, but let's, let's break this down a little bit deeper. So let's talk about the thorax. It's a little bit easier to see in the thorax because stuff moves a little bit more, uh, but the same thing is gonna be happening in the pelvis. So what we wanna do, Johnny, is we're gonna we're going to cut the thorax right through there. So right about the, say the fifth rib at the bottom of the sternum, we're going to chop it straight through there and then we're going to look down upon it. So, so the diagram that I have posted up here is a cross section of the thorax through the scapula. And so we can see where the humerus is. And what I want to do is I want to talk you through um, how we manipulate internal and external rotation by the position of the scapula. So if you look at this first diagram, what we have is a representation of what we would consider some sort of normal average kind of a thing where the scapula would rest 30 degrees off the imaginary frontal plane. And so that gives us a starting position. The starting position is kind of important to, to understand because as we start to move through space time, we're gonna see differences in concentric and eccentric orientation. So if I have an anterior compression, what I'm gonna end up with is I'm gonna get expansion on the posterior side. And what this is gonna do, it's gonna change the angle of the scapula relative to the imaginary frontal plane. So now if I have a 60 degree angle, I pick up concentric orientation on the back side of that shoulder. So if you wanna pick on a muscle, you could say spinaeus picks up concentric orientation and then i have a limitation of internal rotation so that's how the anterior compression works and so if i want to expand anteriorly what i have to do is i have to reverse this process so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to pick a shoulder girdle position i'm going to pick an activity that produces concentric orientation of the muscles between the scapula so i'm going to compress that dorsal rostral area i'm going to pin the medial border of that scapula against the rib cage and what that's going to do it's going to drive the expansion forward so now what i have is i have a change in that angle of the scapula so it's now at a much flatter angle relative to the frontal the imaginary frontal plane and so what that does is it gives me eccentric orientation on the back side of that shoulder, and now I pick up the internal rotation. So that's basically the mechanism that we're talking about. And so that's how reaching activities tend to work, is they create this dorsal rostral compression, they get the anterior expansion, I get my pump handle back, and then bingo, bango, I get my internal rotation. Now, you brought up a really, really cool uh, representation of, of how some of this gradient stuff works within a muscle. And I, and I think you're actually correct. And so what we have to understand is that when a muscle is concentric or eccentrically oriented, we can also look at it as a, as a gradient uh, effect as we move dynamically. And so one of my favorite representations is when we look at a, a baseball pitcher. So if I was a right-handed pitcher and I'm reaching towards home plate with my glove side, I have to be able to internally rotate this shoulder. My, my, my left shoulder has to be able to internally rotate. But I'm, I'm rotating from distal to proximal. And so what happens if we pick on pec major for a second, as I internally rotate, I'm gonna start my internal rotation from distal to proximal, which means I'm gonna gain concentric muscle activity at the, the attachment of pec major at the shoulder. As I turn, I'm gonna have more concentric orientation distally than proximally, and what that's gonna allow me to do as I internally rotate, I have this nice little gradient effect where I have compressive strategy that moves from distal to proximal, which keeps my pump handle up long enough for me to get my internal rotation. If I was to concentrically orient that pec 
Um, from an absolute standpoint, without this gradient effect, I would get compressive strategy on the sternum, which would hold that sternum back. I get the posterior expansion, which is nice for external rotation, but I block my internal rotation. And so you're gonna see some form of compensatory strategy as I throw, where I'm gonna elevate the shoulder, or I'm gonna side bend my head as a substitution for that shoulder internal rotation. So if I break out the toothpaste tube, and we can kind of look at this um, from, from the bottom up here, is that what I get is I get this gradient where I, I have a compressive strategy distally and I get the expansion proximally. So it's a nice little representation as to how this muscle um, gradient uh, influence kind of works. Now, as far as addressing these pump handle mechanics, um, you can do it unilaterally and you can do it bilaterally. Um, from, the, from a narrow ISA standpoint, I do a lot of the bilateral stuff because we can immediately go to, to quadruped in, in many instances. So I might use like a bear position or eventually um, some form of crawling and then, and then to a bear crawl. When I'm talking about the wide ISA people, um, they tend to have the, the uh, quite a bit of anterior compression already. It's very difficult for them to, to achieve the, the pump handle mechanics. So it's much easier to go after those people from a unilateral standpoint because I can create a much stronger compressive strategy on the backside and then um, create the yielding capabilities or eventually eccentric orientation on that anterior side. So Johnny, this is a great question. Thanks for asking. Um, hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, keep asking questions at askbillhartman at gmail.com. Askbillhartman at gmail.com. Everybody have a great Friday. Have an outstanding weekend, and I'll see you next week.